deafening silence gives little indication of the action that's about to erupt. Hundreds of hardy men and women patiently and nervously prepare themselves and their craft for an annual adventure unlike anything else on the planet. The 44th Annual Avon Descent. This year, the race begins on a reflective note as the power dinghy fleet gathers in silent tribute to multiple winner and official event legend Ian Williamson after his death a few months earlier. Now, the game begins in earnest as before them lie two days at 124 kilometres of exhilarating action and incredible endurance. So the adrenaline's already kicking in for this and yeah, I can't wait to hit the, the wheel. But it's just about getting down the river today cleanly, so yeah, it's, it's a very exciting morning, so it's been a big build up. The power boats, the speed freaks of the competition, line up to get the gun. And first off the line is the boat of Avon Descent veteran Gary McNamara in his 40th appearance in the race. I love it. I love the river. I love all this part of it. Yeah, it's just wonderful. And doing 40 is just amazing. <laughs> Then, the fancied favourites jostle for position and wave after wave of whitewater warriors open the throttle and roar into action. Last year's runners-up, Jay Branson and race partner Byron Jane, are highly fancied to take the title. It's going to be fast and furious and with the competition we've got going on, like with Scott Goodbody this year and Matty Even and all those crew, but they're, they're all flying so it's so much fun just to be able to race and have fun with your mates. You know? But it all goes horribly wrong for them at the very first obstacle, Northern Weir. This twist of fate puts a serious dent in their line honours aspirations, but the pair quickly put it behind them and are soon back up and running. But with the difference between winning and losing, often measured in seconds, they have a monumental fight in front of them, if they're to claw back enough time to close the gap to the leaders. After Northern Weir, the racers have the pedal to the metal in a rush towards day one's most challenging obstacle, the daunting and dangerous Extracts, now renamed Williamson Weir. This newly redesigned wall of stone will test even the best as competitors hurl themselves and their craft across and into the fray with scant regard for life or limb. Any delay at Williamson Weir could have consequences later. You can't win the race there, but if you're not careful, you could certainly lose it. And boat number 11 is finding the going a little tough. Back at the start line, the paddlers are ready to take their turn on the river. For the event's muscle men and women, it's about more than just speed. It's power, technique and incredible endurance. And this year, the high water means the ride will be full of unpredictable and dangerous twists and turns, which many of the competitors will have never experienced before. It's my first one, so I'm going to try and give it a go. Hopefully my body will hold out and so will the boat. This is my 12th ever on the set, and the first year I did it was in a double with a mate. So this is Paul's first year, so I thought I'd give him the opportunity to do it as a double as well. Yeah. So. Always, I make all the decisions. <laughs> I just paddle. Yeah, I started when I was 55, I'm now 68, and uh, it's, it's terrific. Yeah, anybody can do it. I could not be happier being here this weekend with all my mates and 
racing at home. The oven regularly attracts competitors from all over the country and around the world. This year, a group of Iron Men from the East Coast are trying their luck for the very first time. So, you know, for me, it's something new and I'm super excited to get out there and have fun. I'm a little bit nervous, more about the distance. I think going down the river should be fun, but I mean, hopefully we get through day one. It's really cool. I think the whole way it's set up and the way the race runs is that it's very, very competitive, it's very fierce competition, but at the end of the day, you've got to go through rapids and rocks and you've got to negotiate a lot of different things that we normally would. But their day doesn't quite go to plan. Find out what happened a little later. As the paddlers approach the start, the adrenaline rises. A flurry of blade strikes sends a spray of water into the air and the odyssey begins. Coming up, the power and the paddle. Day one continues and the river starts to take its toll on the field. With the powerboat streaking ahead, the paddlers find their rhythm and soon the obstacles that took toll on their motorised companions begin to inflict similar punishment on them. The fleet of paddlecraft face their first test at Northern Weir and one by one, with varying degrees of success, they make their way across. From here, with the elite paddlers leading the way, they push on downstream, every stroke bringing them closer to the perils of Williamson Weir. As the paddlers push forward, the powerboats surge ahead. After conquering Williamson Weir, they take on the trials of 2J Rabbits. They might appear to be relatively docile, but as many have found out, can pack a real punch if you get it wrong. Next are the notorious tea trees, a twisted maze of bush and branch that play havoc with competitors and boats alike. Then it's on toward the day one finish line at Cobbler Pool. Fast finishers MR2 racing team of Tom Hodgkinson and Brent Dunbar power across the line to take day one honours. It was excellent, it was brilliant, we had a really, really clean run. Um, we pushed a bit hard in, a, in the trees and nearly came unstuck but held it together. We had one moment at x tracks where we kind of glanced off a rock and speared off towards the crowd but managed to save that. So, uh, yeah, to come up uh, close behind the leaders, having started a few grids behind towards the end was, was great and on corrected time to be only uh, to be 13 seconds in front was, uh, yeah, we were stoked. The 144 boys, Jay and Byron, have made up plenty of lost places to finish in fifth place, still a whopping four minutes off the lead. We got off to a mediocre start, we were with Mike Crosser and uh, he's a great competitor and we uh, hit, the, hit the weir pretty well with him and uh, just got caught up on his wake and flipped us over really quickly. So our day went from being competitive to being what it is in about 30 seconds. Not everyone has found the going easy. One support team is patiently waiting for boat 289 to come in. Back at Williamson Weir, the paddlers have hit the wall. Literally, the newly constructed chute has kept the field on its toes, with the river claiming its fair share of boats. And while it's not total carnage, there is a price to pay for the unprepared. From here, it's downstream to 2J and the rapids.
The final push to the finish through the tea trees gives at least one competitor a headache. First under the banner at Cobbler Pool is Josh Kippen, with a gap to Brendan Rice. Basically raced my race plan and uh, managed to drop Ricey through the trees, so I had a pretty clean run all day, so no mistakes, which is, is nice. And the Iron Men from the East didn't exactly get the start they were dreaming of. We uh, actually arrived late, we missed our start time, um, which we kind of had the, the timing wrong, so Ever, we were right and they were right and we turned up late, so but at the end of the day it doesn't matter because you go off, we were I think 27 or 28, but it was kind of nice to go through and start on 28 grid because you got to paddle past all the people that make this race necessary, you know, that turn up and support it. Um, there's always going to be one winner, there's always going to be a champ, but they're the punters that turn up year in and year out, you know, so having that luxury of being late, I got to paddle past guys who had told me they've done it for 30 years, guys that have done it for 24 years, 20 years. Uh, so it's a pretty cool experience. After a day of frustration and dilemma, boat 289 crew Sean Collins and Ben Davis, in their first descent, finally get to the finish. Their race is run, and they found out the hard way what the Avon is all about. Paddle, how long do you think you'll ride your paddle for? Oh, a long way, about eight or nine k. As day one closes out and the crews recover, it's time for repairs to craft and reassessment of race strategy because tomorrow it's on again. Riverland was really, really good today, so I think um, I think most people had a fairly good day. There's a few obstacles down the valley, so yeah, something to look forward to. Always a bit nervous. Up next, the boats bash and crash their way down the valley and the fight for first place is far from over. In the dim light of dawn on day two, racers prepare themselves for the challenge ahead. Emu Falls seems to be the point that you either make it or you don't. If you make it past Emu Falls, it's all good. <laughs> Falling two or three times early, you know, it's, you start losing feeling in your fingers and start not thinking straight. So, yeah, that's my name. Try to stay in in those first couple of hours before the sun hits you. A little bit nervous about today because it's a bit different. Um, the rappers are going to be, we'll need to be on our game, but um, yeah, excited. Yeah. A bit nervous. Yeah, it's my sort of second time down the valley. So going as a novice from uh, northern yesterday, so it was a bit nerve wracking. And then um, it was a good day though. And then today, I've, it's my second time down the valley. So I'm, uh, you know, full of nerves, really. Yeah, it'll be fun. Yeah. At 7 a.m., the paddlers are first to go. Three, two, one. Away they go. With overnight leader Josh Kippen showing the way, followed by Brendan Rice and the pairings of Matt Coots and Ben Dallin, with Brett McDonald and Peter Tomzak hot on their heels. Ahead of them lies a series of testing obstacles. But first, it's more of the tea trees and then the super shoot a switchback bend that can be treacherous for the unlucky or unwilling. Beyond the super shoot, the ride really gets rough and the spectre of Emu Falls looms large in the minds of the competitors. This has literally been the tipping point for many an Avon adventure and this year it's no different. After emus, the race is on to get to flat water. But there's one more big obstacle ahead, Bell's Rapids. This is the final white water section of the race, 
but it's been a watershed moment for many a campaign and this challenge lives up to its reputation once again. As the paddlers pass through these rapids, the power boats are ready for their final day's run. They'll blast through the trees and super shoot. But when they get to Emu Falls, it all comes unstuck for the leaders. Overnight leaders, Tom and Brent, get caught up in the carnage, as do many others. But will they be able to recover enough time to keep hold on first place? The next hour will hold all the answers. And race fortunes change as boat after boat takes a beating on this dangerous stretch of rock. Coming up, more thrills and spills as the power boats try to beat bells and the final charge to the finish line. With the finish line in their sights, the power boats come to the last hurdle before the flatwater drag race. Ahead lie the notorious Bells Rapids, where brute force and technique must come together to make it through this rocky challenge. With the last of the paddlers still struggling through, the speed freaks come hurtling into the frame. First on the scene is the M2 Technology 007 team of Michael Prosser and Perrin Franks. Even with a hiccup, they soon get away down the rapids, widening the gap on the field. Next boat through is a surprise. The 144 boys, Jay and Byron. They charge through the obstacle and are on their way and the overnight leaders are still nowhere in sight. Soon, Bomek Racing's Matt Even and Nick Gardner blast through, with father-daughter team Alana and Steve Brown in hot pursuit. Son of Ian, Todd Williamson and his partner Emma Thompson in boat 166 roar through, and one by one the Poweries cut their way through bells, with varying degrees of success. Some being left high and dry by the experience. Now, the focus is on the finish line at Bayswater, and with two days and 124 kilometres behind them, the end of the Yavin can't come soon enough. Ultimate Paddlecraft honours go to Josh Kippen, exhausted but ecstatic as he claims the paddle crown with Brendan Rice right beside him in second. Yeah, well we've spent the last two days together. We've been together for pretty much all but the last hour of, of day one, so we've done a lot of hours <laughs> yeah, working yeah. together this weekend. A lot of bonding. <laughs> yeah, bonding, yeah. <laughs> Before Matt Coots and Ben Dallin, two-thirds of last year's winning combination, Bring it home as the first duo. This first couple of hours, I think we had a pretty cruisy run. Emus was really messy, just rocks everywhere. We gave the nose of the boat a, a huge whack. Um, and then after that, we had, we had one swim coming down Sitch, um, but uh, nice icy water wakes you up and uh, gives, you, gives you energy for the rest of the way, so not too bad.
Hot off the celebrations of paddlers, the unmistakable roar of the first powerboat fills the air. Michael Prosser and Perrin Frank kept up the lead on the home stretch and go two better than last year's third place to claim the crown. It was a really clean, great run until we got to Bells and just went really pear yeah. but we were lucky that we managed to get through uh, with less uh, consequence, I suppose, than the other two M2 boats. To have come from Northern to Bayswater and to yeah. have done it faster than anybody else is something pretty special. Freaking amazing. <laughs> so much fun. The 144 boys, Jay Branson and Byron Jane, aren't far behind with a brilliant second day to push them into third overall. We went out today and just both decided, let's just have fun and really enjoy ourselves. You know, we had, there was a small boat issue that created the problem at, at Northam and then also um, sort of the rest of the uh, day, but we, we got through and had a lot of fun, you know. It's just good fun racing your mates. Matthew Even and Nick Gardner cross third, but take silver overall with Justin Green and Scott Goodbody and father-daughter team Alana and Stephen Brown rounding out the top five. And so the party begins. Remarkable achievements, unique experiences and extreme perseverance make for inspiring moments at the finish line. From the milestone men Daryl Long and Paul Genovese. We really, um, you know, struggled. Uh, yeah, um, but, uh, but uh, proud, the proudest punch where we're here. And, um, you know, we, we wanted to be competitive. To the phenomenal 40th finish for Gary McNamara. This has been an event to remember. What many are calling the perfect river created an irresistible balance between nature's power and the race's passion. The weather, for the most part, favoured the spectators on both days. And the experiences of participants make next year's race one to look forward to, when favourites and new faces step up to take on the challenge of the Avon Descent.